Good evening and welcome to the ATSDR update meeting for Merrimack, New Hampshire. My name is Jonathan Alley and I'm the toxicologist with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And tonight I'm joined by staff from DES and ATSDR. So first I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Kathleen Bush from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services to introduce herself. Hi everyone, glad to be here tonight. I'm Dr. Katie Bush from the Division of Public Health Services within the Department of Health and Human Services. And we're excited to share with you some updates related to the ATSDR Apple Tree Program. I guess I'll pass it over to our guests from ATSDR who are here, starting with Tara Summers. Tara, you're still muted. Dang, sorry, because <laughs> I'm on the phone and the computer. I'll start again. I'm Tara Summers. It's uh, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. I'm the Regional Director for ATSDR Region 1, um, and I'm on this webinar this evening with my colleague, Captain Gary Perlman. Gary, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> my name is Gary Perlman. As uh, Tyra indicated, I'm a regional representative within ATSDR Region 1. We cover all of New England's six states. I'm glad to be here as a panelist to answer any questions that may come up. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you all for joining us. So before we get started on the presentation tonight, I just wanted to go over a couple housekeeping rules regarding having a virtual webinar. So tonight's meeting is being held on GoToWebinar and is being recorded. And this goes along with any comments or questions that are submitted to us. If you're having any technical issues, please contact Alyssa Moody at the number listed here or at that email address. This has also been provided inside of the comment box. You can submit a comment or question at any time by going to the questions function on the sidebar, typing in your question and hitting enter. We'll be reviewing those and responding to those later this evening after we finish the presentation. We also just ask that everyone be courteous and thoughtful with your questions, that way we can all have a good experience tonight. Additionally, if you're using any kind of VPN network, it's a good idea to log off of that before you continue on the webinar that can sometimes cause some issues with this platform. Additionally, if you're having any issues hearing or if the audio sounds a little bit funny, try logging out and then logging back in to go to webinar. So that's just close out the function and then log back in through the link that was sent to your email. Sometimes that fixes everything. If not, feel free to contact Alyssa Moody. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So the goal of tonight's meeting is to give an overview about this program that is a partnership between the state of New Hampshire and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. We wanted to reach out to the Merrimack community because there are some folks in this community that are aware of this program and we're hoping that we could share some information about it and what it can do for your community or for others. So we're going to provide an overview of this cooperative agreement, which we call Apple Tree. There's another piece of this that focuses on childcare siting and childcare facilities called Choose Safe Places that Dr. Katie Bush will provide an overview for. And then after that, Captain Summers and Perlman will provide an update on ATSDR's activities, including the health consultations for the town of Merrimack. We'll then open it up for questions, comments, or any thoughts that folks would like to share with us. So again, if you have any of those comments or questions, feel free to submit them at any time. We will be coming back to those in the later part of this. And then we'll finish with providing our contact information if you'd like to reach out to us after this meeting. So just to start with, this is just an acknowledgments of one, this is work supported by a grant and cooperative agreement provided by ATSDR. The State of New Hampshire is very thankful for that. We're also very thankful for a lot of folks that were on this webinar today that provided letters of support for us to obtain this. We're also wanted to thank um, DHHS and DES for providing staff time so that we could host this meeting. And we also want to thank Jim Martin, who's going to be our moderator tonight, because I cannot use this technology on my own. So it's very important we have Jim and Alyssa with us tonight. And then finally, this is focused on the project of ATSDR and the work that we can do to help educate and promote health in the community. Well, we understand that in the town of Merrimack, there are a lot of issues going on focused around PFAS and the St. Cobain investigation. This is not a DES meeting on the St. Cobain investigation. So if you do have questions about that, you can submit those and we will forward those to the appropriate people in our programs. 
but we are not going to be answering those questions about the St. Cobain investigation tonight. So to start with, what is this program? This program is basically aimed to help us identify sites of concerns with known or suspected contamination issues. So this could be sites in the state that are Superfund sites or known waste sites. This could also be sites like PFAS that we're starting to find around our state and various communities. So what we want to do is identify where this is an issue. We want to figure out what are the needs of those communities for developing or promoting education with the various stakeholders. And those stakeholders could be community residents, they could be town officials, public health officers, as well as clinicians or even childcare centers in that community. And then finally, this program provides additional support and funding for us to do this. So we've been able to expand our staffing and we're also looking for new positions so we can continue doing more of this work both in Merrimack and other communities around the state. Now this has two components and I'm gonna talk about the first part of that tonight, which is apple tree. And then Dr. Bush will discuss Choose Safe Places. So apple tree is an acronym. For all of you that have had interactions with the CDC or with the state, we love our acronyms. But Apple Tree stands for ATSDR's partnership to promote local efforts to reduce environmental exposures. And what this does is it helps us look at specific exposure pathways. So for example, with the health consultation that's being provided to Merrimack, this is looking at private wells as well as the public water systems and drinking water as a source of exposure. But then it also allows us to focus on developing materials for education and outreach to the affected communities. And that's something we'd like to hear from you tonight is maybe what kind of materials or topics are really important to you that maybe we could help with. And then finally, review of health outcome data. So when possible and when feasible, we want to look at existing health data and see if there's any relationship between that and exposures, or if there's ways that we can improve those health outcomes for a community. Now, the way that we do this for our portion with this apple tree program is by generating certain work products. And these work products can include activities like community engagement, which can be as simple as the meeting that we're having tonight, or maybe it's starting to work more with some of the advisory panels. So we know that there's a community advisory panel around the St. Cobain investigation. We know that there's several legislative commissions that are keenly interested in the environmental health impacts of certain contaminants. So we can try to work on that, or maybe it's just helping with education and outreach in those areas. We're keenly aware that there are several groups in Merrimack and around the state, as well as at our universities that are working on developing educational materials focused on PFAS, as well as other contaminants. So this gets into the second category of technical assistance, where if you have community groups that are maybe looking at writing grants for projects, maybe we can help by reviewing those or finding additional information or supporting the state and some other risk assessment activities around these contaminated sites. A third product is health consultation. This is an activity that ATSDR is currently working on and you'll receive an update later tonight for Merrimack, New Hampshire. And then finally, there are public health assessments, which are really aimed at looking at whether or not a community has been harmed from exposure to a substance that makes recommendations about future study needs. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Katie Bush to provide an overview of the Choose Safe Places component of this program. Dr. Bush? Sure, thanks so much. We're really excited to be standing up this new program in New Hampshire and the Choose Safe Places component of this grant. It focuses on three main sort of objectives. One is to help towns at the local level or cities, as well as the state, improve children's environmental health through childcare licensing practices and really optimizing those existing licensing rules. It also works to identify opportunities to work with the childcare sector and increase awareness through education and outreach around environmental health. And the main focus is really on prevention by improving guidance and those licensing rules um, for child care centers and programs, we hope to eliminate um, or reduce environmental exposures where they exist. Thanks. So the Choose Safe Places program really focuses on four factors, and we are currently working to gather data and information related to these and figure out different sources of information that then could support this program going forward. So those four kind of core factors are the former use of sites and to make sure that 
any childcare center being sited in New Hampshire is on a safe space in a safe site. Also to examine nearby sites or nearby activities, proximity to things like gas stations or dry cleaners, or even busy roadways, things that could potentially pose um, a hazard or a risk. Also thinking about naturally occurring contamination. So things like radon or arsenic, or even um, existing lead in the soil perhaps. And then, of course, thinking about safe drinking water, which we know is a topic important to the Merrimack community. So again, this could be naturally occurring contaminants like arsenic or perhaps you know, man-made chemicals such as PFAS. And so the idea is to work with partners at the local and the state level to leverage existing rules and regulations um, and perhaps explore opportunities um, for expanding those where possible, but really to use the existing infrastructure to, to ensure that we are siting childcare facilities in safe places for children. Thank you for that, Katie. So right now, the New Hampshire team consists of a partnership between the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services and the staff listed here, which includes Dr. Bush, Michelle Roberge from DPHS, Gail Gettens, who's helping with health education for child care centers, as well as several partner programs at DHHS. And then in DES, I'm serving as the current project leader for this and the toxicologists. We've also recently hired a new risk assessor, Dr. Robert Thistle, who'll be helping us with these activities. Now, outside of the state, oh, one second, my PowerPoint is struggling with me. Outside of the state, we also have support from, AG, from ATSDR, and that includes Region 1 office and the staff that are here tonight, as well as several subject matter experts who are able to help us with our work for the communities. And then the final partners are stakeholders like you and community residents as well as the local public health officials and support from the EPA regional offices. So one of the things that this program allows us to do is sort of fill this role of trying to translate and figure out who's the right program to go to for some of this work and how can we address some of these concerns. So sometimes it's a little tricky to work through some of the state bureaucracy and this is sort of a way that we can help identify the appropriate programs to work with to address certain concerns in various communities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over now to Captain Summers and Captain Perlman to provide an update on ATSDR's PFAS-related activities and the activities toward the health console for the town of Merrimack. Thank you. Um, so I'm here tonight. I'm going to give you a little overview of some work that we're doing within the Merrimack community and also a little bit broader look at some of the PFAS work that ATSDR is engaged with in New Hampshire, then nationwide because some of that work that we're doing actually, although it's not directly involving the Merrimack community members, the information we gain from the work we're doing can be helpful for community members to help better understand what PFAS exposures may mean to them and their family members. So uh, the first two things I wanna talk about are documents specifically for the Merrimack area. Um, we are writing two health consultations, which were mentioned as one of the types of documents that sometimes our apple tree partners will write health consultations and sometimes our ATSDR um, staff writes health consultations. And we were requested to write these health consultations before New Hampshire was an apple tree partner in this latest grant round. So the request came to us, ATSDR headquarters or the region, and we are working on two health consultations one is going to be on the private well data. And um, that data is from private wells in five um, towns surrounding the St. Cobain area, which is Merrimack, Litchfield, Londonderry, Bedford, and Manchester. Um, and we are um, looking at the private well data that the state has collected. And when we do a health consultation, what we do, it's not a study. Um, it's a little bit different document. What we do is we first gather the environmental um, data that we can. So in this case, it's drinking water. So we're provided usually from a state partner or sometimes EPA, but in this case, a state partner. We're provided the water concentration levels. And then through a process we've developed to look at environmental contaminants, 
we try to determine are the levels in that water above a level that we would consider safe for the public. And that means everyone in the public from the tiniest babies to the oldest people and everyone in between. And um, if we think it's not safe for people, then we will make a conclusion with some recommendations on what we think we needs to happen for that exposure to hopefully end. So that's kind of the outline of a health consultation. So like I said, we're working on two. One is the private well health consultation where we're looking at private well data. And that document right now, it's going through our internal clearance process. So um, the health assessor has completed the document. It's gone through some review. It's still going through some additional review. And then um, the next step, we'll have a data validation review of the document. It's when we have um, our partners, specifically who provided the data, look at the data again and make sure that we've included all the relevant data that needs to be included. That's called data validation review. They do not look at the conclusions of the document. They're just given the part that shows the data that we've used. And then after that, we release the document for an open public comment period. It's usually about 60 days, but we can, you know, we can change it a little depending on circumstances. Um, it's about 60 days and we release it to the public and any member of the public, anybody who's on this webinar this evening or other folks, anybody is allowed to provide us comments and then we look at all those comments and we will address them before we release the final version of this document. So you as community members will see the public comment version of this document and be able to provide us any comments back you would like us to see and respond to. And we hope um, to have this first private well health consultation out um, in early 2021. I don't have an exact date yet. and. I'm sure many of you can can realize this year has been challenging for all the public health world, including us at ATSDR. Since we are a sister agency to CDC, we've had um, additional work that we're doing with the COVID response. So some things have been a little bit delayed, but we're still working to get our products done. So we hope to have that in early 2021, the first private well health consultation. The second is our public drinking water health consultation. Um, again, that one is looking at um, drinking water from the public water systems from the Merrimack Valley Water District, um, and it's covering some of the wells that were from that district. I can tell you the numbers, uh, two, three, four, five, seven, and eight. And from the period of March 2016 till August 2019. So it's looking at that um, data from that time period. Um, as you can imagine, when you're going to write a document like this, you have to define your parameters of time period or else even as more data is being collected, if you don't sort of put a finite amount of time you're going to look at, you could just wait and wait for more and more data. So that's the parameters of the data we're looking at for that document. And that one is uh, currently being worked on by our health assessor. And again, I would anticipate that one's going to come out second. So I would um, hope maybe late 2021 we'll have that document out for everybody. Um, and again, it would go through the same process where there'll be a public comment period. Anybody can provide us feedback and we'll incorporate that. So those are our two um, Merrimack area specific documents. So some other work we have going on in New Hampshire specifically, we have the Pease Trade Port um, Health Consultations, which we released in 2019 for um, the public drinking water and for private wells. And I bring these up, um, they may be documents, they're on our website, you can search for them um, and we, use those that was our one some of our first health consults written on PFAS for community members so if you look to those documents it'll give you a good idea of what the Merrimack documents sort of how they will be laid out and what a health consultation looks like so um, although different communities the feel of them will likely be the same and it'll give you some idea of what health consultations look like for these PFAS contaminants um, we also have the Pease Trade Port study, which is happening. Uh, they began recruiting participants in late 2019. They had to pause a little because of COVID. They began recruiting again in October 2020, and their goal is to recruit 1,100 adults and 525 children um, who were worked or attended childcare on the Pease Trade Port. Um, and that, again, that study of exposure, where we're looking at some health outcomes from those exposures, will again help all community members across the country better understand the 
types of potential health conditions related to PFAS exposure. We also in New Hampshire, um, we work sometimes um, in collaboration with the Superfund Research Program, which is in Dartmouth. Uh, we've collaborated with them. Um, they're doing some material specific about PFAS in the New Hampshire community. So they're another resource that um, New Hampshire and your community has some access to. And then nationwide, you know, ATSDR, you've probably heard of this, some of you who've been um, following the PFAS issue over time. We have a multi-site study that's happening um, in seven sites. The sites were selected in fall 2019. And that study, um, looking at these seven sites, it'll also bring in the data from the PEACE study. So there'll be a much larger group of study participants than just one site. And that helps us um, really better understand in a much bigger group of people what some um, health effects may be. So you have more power in that study. It makes it a stronger study. Uh, the sites that were selected are in the process of preparing to launch their recruitment for participants at each of the sites. And we have a list of those sites on our um, ATSDR website, too. We can refer you to if you want to know which ones um, are participating. And then finally, we have our exposure assessment, which an exposure assessment is a little bit different than a study. So in an exposure assessment, um, it looks like I may have lost my webcam. I'm not sure why, but I'm just going to keep chatting. So. Um, uh, in an exposure assessment, what we do is look, instead of looking at potential health outcomes, we're really looking to see what a community level exposure was to contaminants. So in this case, again, it's drinking water with PFAS contaminants. And what we did is we um, went into these communities. There's eight communities across the United States. The closest one um, to uh, New Hampshire is there's a site in Westfield, Massachusetts. So we went into eight communities and we had um, randomly selected community members participate with us to give us um, blood serum samples. And we look at that, those samples and then it can help us determine what the exposure was, not just to those individuals who participate, but again, since you randomly select community members, it can help you better identify what the exposure was to the whole community. So that could be really helpful to help us, again, better determine if we have some of these PFAS concentrations in drinking waters, what do we expect um, that to look like when you start looking at people's blood serum levels? So I know that was a lot of information I just threw out there very quickly. <laughs> it was a lot coming at you. But that's just some of the the highlights of the work we're doing, um, which ultimately we hope benefit uh, the residents of Merrimack. So I'll turn it back over to Jonathan. Great, thank you, Tara. Sure. So that concludes our overview of some of the activities that we're gonna be looking at doing with this grant and sort of how it might be able to help out with your communities. And also that update from, again, ATSDR. So thank you, Tara. Now, this is the part where we're gonna open it up for questions from the audience or comments, and we're gonna to try to figure out the best person on the call to answer it. We may not be able to answer all the questions tonight, and that could be either by sheer volume, which we hope you will inundate us with as many questions as you can, because that's helpful. But some of the questions may be beyond what we can answer tonight. And what we plan to do is follow up with these with either the appropriate state agencies or by having conversations with ATSDR for what we can do about that. And then we hope to be able to come back and share that with the community. So please feel free to submit questions at this time. Um, Jim will be our moderator and he will be reading off the questions to us. So if he hasn't got to your question yet, just wait. It might be that you have a very similar question to someone else that's being asked. Hopefully we can get through as many as possible tonight. So again, you go to the questions box, you'll type in your answer and then hit send. And that should be up for submitting questions. If you have any technical issues, again, feel free to reach out to Alyssa Moody by phone or by email and she can help you out. So with that, I will turn over to Jim and ask what questions do we have? Uh, hi, Jonathan. Yes, we have a handful of questions that have already been submitted. Uh, first question is, with PFAS, there is a tension on exposure from drinking water. But what is the risk of exposure through bathing in contaminated water, playing or in dirt or gardening in contaminated soil? 
Okay. So this is a question about contact exposure. So we have a couple different ways that we think about this. So with bathing and with exposure to water, you can have exposure to some PFAS, but it doesn't appear at this time that skin is a major way for PFAS to cross into the body. There are some studies that show that PFAS can cross into the body, but again, it depends on what level is in the water. <laughs> now, if you're wanting to completely cut off all exposure to all PFAS, then you would eliminate that by seeking an alternative source of bathing water. But you know, we also want to bear in mind that that may be difficult for some folks. Now, ultimate goal is to reduce exposure. So I'll leave it to um, Tara Summers from ATSDR to kind of cover how they approach this. But you know, the goal would be to have as little exposure from bathing sources as possible. Again, soil contact same issue where for skin contact you can have small amounts that might cross over into the skin but it might require very large concentrations in the environment to produce significant risk so it's sort of this question of what's the relative risk in that scenario the state of new hampshire does have soil contact standards that are based on exposure to construction workers and to children coming into contact with soils um, we're also aware that other groups are developing different models for looking at this kind of exposure. So this is a growing area of science. Um, Tara, do you have anything you'd like to add? So I think Gary Perlman, my colleague, would be the best person to yeah. answer that question because he's really up on all this. Yeah, thank you. The, the, the question is very helpful. So I worked on the, the PEAS health consultations and as Tara indicated, those looked at drinking water pathways of exposure, which is what's being done in these instances as well for the private wells and the public water. The contaminant we're most concerned with is the PFAS compounds and the pathway of exposure of most concern in this case is drinking water. The bathing and showering scenario, we don't really have as much scientific information on that to determine, as Jonathan indicated, how much of it actually crosses the skin and is it significant if it does? Additionally, when someone bathes or showers, some of it may off-gas in the air and may breathe in some. And we also lack enough scientific information because these compounds are known as emerging contaminants of concern. So the science is evolving on those. So we also lack enough information on how to determine those. So the current focus, which we feel is the most protective of health, is to look at the drinking water pathway. Um, as Jonathan indicated, we also do have a soil comparison value to look at if contaminants such as the PFAS are in soil, what levels below which are not a concern. And that includes several issues. Primarily, those look at incidental ingestion. So if a child plays on soil and then does some hand-to-mouth activity, either through a toy or directly through the hand, that can be evaluated. But generally, the dermal exposure pathway is not a significant one, and that's why we focus primarily on drinking water. Great, thank you, Gary. All right, uh, the second question we have here, when you are looking at PFAS risks, are you including other compounds or only those with state MCLs? I, I can take that if you want, Jonathan. Sure. Go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, so PFAS is actually, it's a group of compounds. There could be many of them. ATSGR has developed what's known as comparison values for four of them. They consist of PFOA, PFOS, PFHXS, and PFNA. There's two other ones that we've also looked at and we've used another state value, which is PFBA and PFBS. When we evaluate these contaminants, we look at them singularly, and then, in other words, one at a time to see what the exposure would look like. We also do group them together because we know, for instance, PFOA, PFOS, and PFHXS have similar endpoint toxicities. And so in that case, we can combine those and determine if there's a risk from those together. When we have other ones <clears throat> that don't have a comparison value, we have some other ways of evaluating that. But again, as these are contaminants that are emerging from the scientific perspective, we don't have as much sophisticated uh, techniques to evaluate those. 
But we do have some way of evaluating multiple contaminants at a time, but primarily we do focus on the four that we have comparison values and the two additional ones. Do you have anything to add, Jonathan, or do you want to go on to the next question? No, that's great. Thank you. Okay, the next question is, how do we initiate testing of our well water? So testing of your well water, that depends on where you're at. And this is a question for, if you're in the Merrimack area, this would be a question for Jeff Martz and the folks that are looking at the St. Cobain investigation. If you want to go to the New Hampshire DES webpage, you can find contact information there. Um, so if you just look up NHDES PFAS, we have a PFAS webpage that has information and how you can get that um, contact information for getting well testing done. Again, this depends on the area that you're at. So you'll want to contact the team and see which area you're in and if you fall in certain categories for well testing. So that falls a little bit outside of our program activity because we do not have funding to go out and do testing. We can help support the activities of the state and it's testing that it does and looking at that data, but we don't actually do testing ourselves. Okay, we have a question sort of comment um many private well owners in the merrimack area have installed whole house uh granulated active carbon filtration systems and or reverse osmosis systems at the faucet i'm concerned that some of the well samples were taken post filtration so they may not have shown pfas when the sorry when the well water may have actually been contaminated So I think this is a question, again, for our water division, for the waste division that's handling the investigation around St. Cobain to check when they have been doing that testing or if they've been doing pre or post filtration. So if you want to, if you have a specific question for your home, if you want to submit, um, just sort of raise your hand or submit that comment in the question box, we can follow up with you. Um, typically with DES, I believe it depends on what they're looking at with the compounds. So I'm not going to guess what the testing team has been doing when they've been testing around there or what consultants may have been doing for the St. Cobain investigation. Um, it is a good question to be asking, you know, was the testing done pre or post treatment? And if that determines whether or not a well was contaminated. Um, so that's something that we can reach out to Jeff Martz and talk to him about and see if we can get some more information shared with the public about that. Uh, then I can just add from the public health laboratory side where private wells samples are submitted for testing um, independent of any investigation. Usually there's an intake form and so it would be up to the homeowner submitting that sample. They can check boxes whether that test was taken pre or post treatment and also what type of treatment is maybe installed in the home. And so usually we, you know, we call that metadata or sort of the background data. Usually that isn't also available for us to take into consideration when analyzing the data. Again, I can't speak to any samples taken as part of the investigations, but in terms of general well water samples that are submitted to the public health laboratory, I know that data is often collected on the intake form. All right, thank you very much. Next question, when writing and reviewing the data, who are, who are your contact people in the community and town government? Have you considered actions already in progress when writing your recommendations? So I'm gonna let Gary answer that first relative to what's going on with Merrimack and their health consultation. And then I'll sort of explain the process that we have kind of moving forward for additional work that the state program oh. will be. Yep, thank you, Jonathan. Um, as an example, when we worked on the PEAS document, we routinely work with state and local officials, primarily the DES, as well as uh, water district uh, administrators to have them provide input to us as far as sampling, frequency, um, detection limits, and other parameters of concern. We also, when we do this document, as Tara indicated, we release it 
initially as a data validation draft, which is those parties that participated in giving us some of the data have an opportunity to look at the data to be sure it's accurate and done properly. Secondly, uh, during the public comment period, when we provide review of the data, as well as conclusions or recommendations, we work closely with regulatory and other authorities to help us determine what's the best way forward. So we, it's a flexible document, and it's uh, primarily focused on addressing community concerns, as well as if there's agencies or others that have concern. So it's an ongoing process that we uh, routinely collaborate with different entities. Thank you, Gary. And just to follow up, that's one of the things that with moving forward on these projects, we do recognize that there's a lot of involvement from communities, especially in Merrimack. We know that several of you have been very involved in what's going on with PFAS. And as we do additional work in your community and in other communities, we do want to make sure that we identify those appropriate stakeholders. So whether that's existing community groups that have identified concerns, if that's reaching out to educational or child care centers, public health officers, town or municipal officials, but then also connecting back with other relevant stakeholders that maybe aren't what we usually think of as being involved in a site. So one example might be reaching out to appropriate academic partners if we find that a site has issues with metals. Um, you know, in New Hampshire, we have Dartmouth in our state, and they're a terrific resource when it comes down to heavy metal toxicity, and they're also starting to get involved in PFAS efforts, and they've been a tremendous partner to us in developing educational materials. And one thing I wanted to add, Jonathan, I forgot, is um, we also participated in a health fair that occurred at the high school in Merrimack which was another way to outreach to communities who had concerns and could uh, we could record some of the concerns and move forward with those. So we do a lot of outreach and try to collaborate with all the key stakeholders, as Jonathan indicated. Thank you. Uh, and just one more. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Jonathan. No, okay. <laughs> I was going to say one thing I I didn't mention that I really should have is that when we release health consultations. We often also have a public meeting at the time of the release of the document so we can share the results with community members. And um, that's a chance for community members to ask us questions right then. And we can go over the process of how ATSDR comes to the conclusions that it comes to. So um, again, in the case of PEAS, we had um, set up different types of public meetings based on the type of document. So for example, for the public drinking water document, um, we had a, a meeting where it was more open to everyone from the public to come and um, talk to us about their concerns. And we did outreach to the town officials to like we, for example, we can go to a select board or a health department or um, like a board of health meeting and, and go over our conclusions as well. So local officials have the information they need. And then for the private well document, we took a slightly different approach. Um, you know, when you're talking about people's private wells, and in our documents, we do not put personally identifying information and we don't identify individual wells. So we'll just make that clear. Um, we talk about the wells in a, in a more general way. However, we know that <clears throat> well owners, you know, it's your personal water source. And so you, you may feel less comfortable being in a, in a larger public meeting with people talking about um, all sorts of things when you just want to answer questions about your well. So we can have meetings that are like a public availability session where our health assessors can be there and members of the public can come in and ask questions in, in a slightly um, less large scale format. And that gives people an opportunity to ask individual questions they might not want to ask in front of a large group. And I think that was a method that worked well and we would replicate again for these documents. Uh, again, the challenge being right now, everything's virtual, right? That's why we're having this meeting like this and we're not all in person. I'd much rather be in person, but we're virtual. And we have adapted this year to have more of our um, document meetings that when we release a document be virtual. So we can make that happen as well. And Tara, I just want to add this to Gary. Um, but those are valid, very good points. 
And one thing with the private well for peas, we also had essentially one-on-one -on -one sessions if those who wish to call us privately to ask us questions. But also when the document is released for public comment period, that's where anyone can provide comments to us. We address all the comments that become part of the document in some instances can actually change the document. So it's essentially, it's your document to help us refine it to meet the needs of the community. Yeah, Katie, would, did you have a comment? Yeah. Well, sure. I was just gonna add, I wanted to acknowledge that I think there are several state representatives on the phone and also members of the HB 737 Legislative Commission focused on PFAS in Southern New Hampshire, which I also have the opportunity to serve on. And I just, to the, to the earlier question of how are we working with communities and how are we identifying stakeholders, there is an education subgroup of that commission really focused on trying to identify key partners and you know, working to identify those partners and then develop materials. And so I just wanted to acknowledge the role of that commission and thank you to many of the members who I think are joining us today. I think that they'll be an important body as we go forward and sort of a liaison to many of the community groups working there. And we know there are also other community groups. And I think as, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, sort of our commitment to engage with the, the groups that already exist in Merrimack. And one last thing that I would add is, you know, if there's an idea that we didn't bring up or that maybe we didn't mention and you think would be important for us to consider, please feel free to submit in the comment box and we will see that. We're gonna have all the comments and we're going to review them after this. So if you have any thoughts or anything you'd like us to be thinking about, feel free to submit that in there. All righty, next, next question is, any estimate of timing, staffing, cost per child, transportation, et cetera? So, um, Maybe you'll have to decipher what the question, what the person is asking there. I'm thinking that that might be related to the Choose Safe Places program. Katie, do you want to take a stab at that first? Well, I can speak to the timeline of the program. So we're currently operating under a three-year funding structure. And so this first year was about staffing up and really what they're calling a landscape assessment where we get to know our partners in the child care sector and the licensing sector. Um, then we'll move into sort of a needs assessment where we explore opportunities to expand on those current rules and regulations and practices and policies that guide the work. And then the third year will be the development and implementation of a strategic plan and so we hope, you know, already thinking ahead, we think that that plan will include some training opportunities for, for regulators and local health officers to increase sort of baseline knowledge of environmental health risks in the childcare realm, but also working directly with childcare providers to increase those, their awareness as well of environmental risks so that when we then are engaging them around well water testing or radon testing or soil testing, you know, there's a shared understanding of why that type of work is important and the importance to reducing exposures from a children's health perspective. So that in terms of sort of funding and timing, um, you know, I, I think I'm not sure about the rest of the question and you could feel free to add another comment if I haven't answered it exactly. But in terms of costs, you know, we, we're hoping that, again, to use the existing structure within the, the state licensing rules and um, other regulatory sort of policies and checklists that already exist and just make them more robust, again, increase training where it may be necessary. Um, and we're hoping this will really be more of a sort of a voluntary program where programs are excited to opt in and, and really just um, do the best that we can with the policies in place. So in terms of cost, I'm not quite sure, you know, I, I can't speak to that at all and maybe they could clarify their question, but I hope that answers some of the question at least. Okay, next question we have is, how many years have people in these studies been exposed to PFAS? Uh, I think you're talking about the ATSDR, um, the P's, trade port study um, for that one we are looking at people who were um, on the trade port so either um, 
working there or attending childcare. Because again, remember the Peace Trade Port, it, it's not a place people lived. It's, it's like a place people worked and went to school, childcare. So we're looking at people who are on the trade port between 2004 and 2014. So gosh, 2004 feels like just yesterday, right? But it's already about 16 years ago. So um, that's what we're looking at for for that study. And then um, for the exposure assessments, it varies a little bit um, site by site because it depends on um, you know, when we can identify that the community started to be exposed to contamination. So it, it changes a little place by place. I hope that answers the question. So at least 16 years for the PEAS study. And I can add a, just a quick um, sort of update. So in around 2014, that is when EPA um, had identified PFAS as a group of compounds known as emergent contaminants of concern, and therefore provided some impetus to have others evaluate the drinking water to see if those contaminants were in it. But the exposures may have occurred prior to that, as Tyra indicated, but the analytical technique to detect it really didn't occur until around 2014. Okay. Uh, can exposure be reduced by limiting air exposure if you are not on a base or near a company? Well, uh, sure. this is Gary. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Gary. No, I was just going to say, so when we evaluate exposure, there are many um, sources of exposure potentially uh, in addition, so we have drinking water as one source. We know that these compounds were used widely in the past for such things as stain treatment of fabrics and carpeting, as well as on such things as popcorn bags, fast food containers, and pizza boxes. Although not currently being used in that capacity, those are some of the instances in the past. As far as inhalation, we don't really have the techniques yet to determine what the inhalation risks are. So I guess one answer could be, you know, that it could be helpful to have less inhalation exposure, though we don't know how that contributes to the overall risk. Sorry, Jonathan, you wanted to add. Oh, no, I was just going to, I know you had mentioned talking about air risk before, so I was just going to call on you. So good job. Thank you. I would just add to you with the exposure assessments we're doing um, in the communities across the country, and those reports will be publicly available soon. The, the, all the data has been collected at all the sites and the reports are rolling out based on um, the order of the site. So Westfield is one of the first sites that was done. So it's going to have its report available pretty soon to talk about the, the data that was collected. And I think you know, part of what the exposure assessments can help us look at for communities is, um, you know, how much of your exposure may come through a source like drinking water. You know, drinking water is something that you have a, a generally a very high exposure to because you need it every day. You cook with it, uh, you drink it, you mix it in food. Um, so that is something that our exposure assessments, we hope, you know, when you look across all eight sites, we'll begin to start answering those questions. If you have a community that has a high level of one of these PFAS contaminants in their drinking water, for example, do you see that level reflected in the people who are drinking the water? And I think those exposure assessments are going to help us start to begin to have a better understanding of those questions, although they're certainly not going to be, you know, able to answer every question, but it's definitely going to help us start to figure that out. So when we do additional work in the future, like a health consultation, we know how much exposure to attribute to something like your drinking water versus other sources in your environment. Okay, the next question comment I have is for Captain Summers. Uh, the question oh, was, they wanted to know how to access the first document. So uh, I'm not sure what they're talking about there. Uh, well, I'm I'm gonna maybe the P's um, 
trade port health consultation. That's one we talked about. What we can do is uh, we have public links to all of these activities and sites, so we can create um, uh, or like a write-up of all the links, and then Jonathan, um, if you have a way to share that with everyone who's who participated, we can send out all those um, links to specific documents and site information. Yeah, and we can even maybe just share that on our PFAS blog. That way, it's not just focused for the people that were in attendance to this. Um, anyone yeah. can have access to that. So we can yeah. share that summary from this meeting. Yeah, they're all publicly available on our ATSDR website. Um, but you know, sometimes it's hard to navigate websites, so we'll try to summarize it. <laughs> Uh, there was a follow-up uh, on the same from the same person. They said also they wanted to know if this concept was used for PCB contamination, and if so, where can they access that data? I'm thinking about what PCB. I think, and I'm going to confer with Gary on this. Um, is it maybe the question is about looking at compounds individually rather than as a group or and as a group maybe that's the heart of the question and Gary, do you one think thing that's is, the driver um, yeah it, it could be right because so pcbs is a class of compounds or many of them such as um pfas as many compounds the techniques we would use to analyze for those two are similar in many ways however pcbs we have a lot more toxicological information about them, particularly that they do cross the skin, and there is some inhalation risk associated with that. So if we were doing a PCB exposure evaluation in a health consultation, we would look at uh, drinking water as one pathway, as well as perhaps others, maybe soil and inhalation. So the techniques are similar, but the more knowledge we have, the more different pathways we can incorporate. Okay, the, the next question may may fall in the same lines where you may be able to provide some additional information. Uh, can ATSDR provide a re reference or website for their PFAST values? Yeah, we can provide a link to ha that has the what we use to do our health assessments with. That shouldn't yeah, be a problem. It typically, we ha when we make um, evaluations of chemicals, we usually develop what's known as a toxicological profile, which looks at essentially all the information we know about a chemical, animal studies, human epidemiological studies, chemical fate modeling. So there was a uh, public comment version for PFAS as a toxicological profile. From that report, we then developed our comparison values. So that report is available online and can be looked at if you wish. Okay, the next person was requesting to ask this question in person, but I, I just wanted to make the comment that that's really not possible in this format. It just becomes technologically complicated. So I apologize for that in advance. Uh, their question is regarding Merrimack's continued expo uh, exposure to air contamination. We have no access to blood testing. I have great insurance and still not successfully, I'm sorry, it's long, um, not successfully had blood testing of my family for PFAS after five years of trying. Our doctors, even at Dartmouth in Manchester and Lebanon are not able to provide any support with how to protect ourselves and can't answer questions such as how vaccines are impacted by PFAS exposure. How can you help help people like me? So I think there's three, I'm gonna break this down into three parts. I think the first one is an access to blood testing and um, the question of insurance covering that. And I think Katie might be able to handle that question best from the DPHS side. And then um, questions around sort of the vaccine and the, some of the questions around COVID and PFAS, I think um, Tara Summers can help out with those questions. So 
I'm going to toss it over to Katie first to take that first piece, and then we'll go to Tara. Yeah, and thank you for that question. I think it helps highlight a lot of the, the need and concerns in the communities. I can't answer with detail, I'm sorry right now, but we can certainly take that back um, and I can ask you know, my colleagues within the health department. My recollection, however, is that there was a recent bill that went through the state as part of sort of when the PFAS regulations also came into place that was going to um, allow for insurance billing of blood testing. And, and so please don't quote me on that, but I do have a vague recollection of that. And I, I think this is, again, a great example of we'll compile these and these questions and bring them back to the right um, experts within our agencies, but also I think bring them to places like the Legislative Commission who are working on, on new regulations and potentially new bills and, and making legislative recommendations. So I just want to validate that we, we hear this concern and I think we will take it back to the appropriate people. And I'm sorry, I don't have more details on the access to insurance piece. I, I guess perhaps it's an opportunity to speak to, we do really feel, and I think the science community really does feel that these studies happening across the nation, whether it's the multi-site study or PEAS study or health consultation, will provide important information um, where we hope the findings will be generalizable to, to broader communities. Yeah, so the vaccine question, um, yes, they're, they're still trying to, we HSCR as well as others who are doing research are still trying to understand all the potential impacts that these contaminants could have on things like immune response and immune response to vaccines. And I think the, the science on that is still evolving. Um, for the COVID vaccine specifically, um, you know, that is adding another layer of sort of complication to the question since that vaccine itself is also very new. So now we're dealing with two things that are relatively new for us in the public health world, um, the effects of PFAS and then, you know, specific new vaccines that are coming along. Um, I will say that with this issue of immune um, effects potentially from PFAS and specifically since we're in a pandemic and so immune issues have become perhaps more heightened for people's concern. Um, APSDR, we're collaborating with CDC in a couple ways. Um, so first, there is, um, CDC is implementing a study that's going to look at COVID-19 among healthcare personnel and first responders. Um, and as part of that, um, it, our HSDR lab folks are going to help um, measure PFAS therm concentrations of the participants. So that way we can start to see if there's any association between um, therm PFAS concentrations and the risk of um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, or as we call COVID, um, infection. So that is ongoing right now. That part has started. Um, we're also um, exploring how to incorporate some of this um, potential COVID research into the multi-site study, thinking that, you know, if we're going to um, embark on this multi-site study, maybe there's a way we can um, incorporate into that looking at COVID-19. And, um, and then third, um, we're in the process of trying to develop a study. So this one's still sort of a little bit not as far along um, to evaluate the intersection between PFAS exposure and, and susceptibility to um, other viral infections, not just COVID-19. So it's just viral infections as a larger category. Which it would include COVID-19, but not be limited to that. And for that, they um, plan to try to recruit some participants um, from existing ATSDR PFAS cohorts um, because we already have the PFAS serum measures and this would be sort of like an additional questionnaire that then we could maybe again, try to piece together some more of this puzzle about um, PFAS and immune response. So I hope that's helpful. And really quick, the third item, I realized I glossed over it when I was kicking things over to Katie and to Tara was, uh, you know, something in that question echoes this point that we know folks from Merrimack and from other communities have been understandably frustrated because physicians, especially primary care physicians, just don't have a lot of knowledge about PFAS. 
Um, coming from a toxicology perspective, I know a lot of primary care physicians just don't have a lot of general knowledge about environmental health issues to begin with. And you know, several of you on the call right now are on commissions that have been discussing this issue. Um, I know Katie Bush has sat in on a lot of those conversations and you know, this is something that we do realize is a need. And that's one of the things where maybe this could be a way that this program from the state side maybe support your community and others is finding a way to make some of these more educational resources better available to physicians and healthcare practitioners. There is some general trainings available, um, web trainings related to environmental health concerns, but there's very, very few, if any, that are focused on PFAS or specifically chemical exposures. So maybe something we could be looking into is trying to figure out a way to reach out to that medical community and figure out what their needs are and what's keeping them from getting to those educational resources. Um, it's nothing that we have an exact solution to, but you know, maybe this is one of the ways we could be working with the commissions to support that kind of work in New Hampshire. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add again that I, I do believe that the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services website originally, you know, maybe back in 2018 or 2019, developed some healthcare provider outreach materials, and so those should be available if you haven't um, reviewed those and, and shared those with your provider. You know, th those resources are there, but I think as Jonathan said, we recognize that there's also a, a gap, and and perhaps more work needs to be done in that area to develop new materials. And again, make sure that they're just sort of always at the front of mind of providers. Um, we know that they have limited time with patients, but how we are committed to sort of increasing awareness of environmental health issues, targeting um, healthcare providers. And again, I think working with our um, university partners at Dartmouth and elsewhere um, to build that partnership is certainly a focus of our grant program going forward. So. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next one is a little bit of a long uh, comment and then question, so please bear with me. The federal health advisory is significantly outdated with states being left on their own. Communities such as ours are exposed to a consistent PFAS cocktail. We are five years into this process and we are still hearing phrases from ATSDR like emerging contaminants. When can we expect acknowledgement of the impact to our health as the research for every PFAS compound shows alterations to multiple organs and systems? Question mark. We can Google, search, and get more information than the ATSDR will say. End of, end of question. Tara or Gary, since that was ATSDR directly. Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say um, that maybe, uh, so EPA had developed provisional health levels, provisional health advisories for uh, PFOA and PFOS, and they were subsequently changed and updated to be um, a different concentration uh, in water. But those are regulatory values that are still not implemented yet. ATSDR is a non-regulatory agency with more scientific support. So our toxicological profile is serving as the basis for us to determine which levels are of concern. I know that the health advisories from EPA have been released, and I know the states have their own numbers. But unfortunately, as an agency, we don't really have too much input into the regulatory determination of these compounds, mostly just the scientific evaluation of them. Yeah, and I was going to add, I I know it it is frustrating that things seem to move at a slow pace, um, especially when it's an exposure you as a community member have had. And I think ATCR with the work we have been able to move forward. I know it feels like a long time, five years, um, and yet it it is a, actually a pretty fast pace con considering the history of some contaminants and how long it takes them to get science to understand what's happening in terms of the toxicology. And the work is evolving. Um, and I think ATSDR, um, if you look at the PEAS um, health consultations that have been released, 
you know, we have come out and said when we think people's exposure has been an exposure that's above what we consider a safe level. So I think ATSDR is willing to tell community members when we think the level is unsafe and as the science evolves and as we learn more, our conclusions over time may change if we learn that these contaminants affect people's health in different ways. Right. Great, thank you very much. Can you please comment on the new information about PFBA, which concentrates in the lung, lungs and is associated with reduced antibody response? And also that PFBA concentrating in the lungs indica indicates an inhalation hazard. Thank you. Um, I can talk to that briefly. I know that um, the Minnesota Health Department had evaluated PFBA, which is also uh, perfluorobutanoate. Um, they developed their own value in drinking water at around seven micrograms per liter. And that was based on the critical effects observed in animals include liver weight changes, changes in um, the thyroid gland, as well as decreased red blood cells. But those values are strictly based on drinking water pathways. Anything beyond that, we weren't able to identify um, inhalation risk because as we indicated, the focus of our research uh, project in this case was just the drinking water pathway. And so therefore, we focused on which um, comparison values to use. And we used the PFBA, specifically one from Minnesota which is one that we hadn't developed on our own. So we didn't look at inhalation and we're not really um, aware, I'm not um, sure that we have additional information on inhalation risks, unless Jonathan, maybe you have more. Yeah, so I know that there was a study of autopsy um, human bodies, I believe it was from Spain, but I'm trying to recall that off the top of my head. So I might be off by a country or border. Um, where they did find that the proportion of PFBA was higher in the lungs, and they suspected that might be related to inhalation exposure. Um, that study didn't connect it to any health outcomes, but a more recent study that hasn't gone past peer review and hasn't finished you know, assessment from other scientists was suggested that there may have been some immunological effects, but we're still waiting to see what happens when that study makes it past peer review and what it's actually saying. Um, we know that PFBA is present where there are other PFAS, but we also know that kinetically and toxicologically it behaves differently. So as Gary was saying, it's sort of difficult to try to compare the different risk from inhalation to ingestion when most of what we understand right now is based on ingestion exposure. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, when can we expect a plan in New Hampshire to educate and direct our public health officers in the role that they should be play, playing in PFAS impacted communities? We, we can't be expected to wait five more years for the national study to confirm the health impacts. So I'll jump in first. So one of the things that this program us as New Hampshire DES and DHHS and ATSDR in this cooperative, we're here to educate, provide technical support, and inform the decision makers. So you know, I think we can all agree that it is important that public health officers and public health officials have as much information as possible so they can address these issues. As far as actually making a policy change, we as a cooperative agreement do not set policies or legislation. The legislatures do. And you know, through some of the legislative commissions that exist, we are happy to provide support to them and find ways to provide them the education, information, or maybe just the guidance on how to improve the existing system. Um, Katie, I don't know if you want to chime in and add to that from your experience with the commissions. You actually sit on commissions. I don't. Well, I was going to speak just to the health officer liaison unit that sits within the Division of Public Health Services. And so there are staff within the department that then coordinate with the health officers across the state, some of whom are probably on this call. 
And I think that that group is actively, you know, considering how how to help build up that workforce within New Hampshire. I think it's an active area that the group is exploring and working with the Health Officer Association. Um, so I, I think that the, to be honest, I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has shined a light on that role and the importance of that role across New Hampshire at the local level and um, environmental contaminants are, are similar in that. And so I think we're committed to working with that program and health officers across the state, again, to uh, thinking of them as a, a partner and a key stakeholder for some of our outreach and education so that um, we sort of have a baseline knowledge and understanding of the risks and and what people can do to remediate those risks or reduce their exposure. So yes, I think health officers are a key partner in all of this. Um, and we, we certainly work with them within our agency with, at, at the health officer liaison unit. And then um, I think are looking forward to engaging more in the future um, with partners across the state at the local level to increase, um, again, sort of knowledge, skills, and abilities related to environmental health and environmental exposures. All right, thank you. Uh, are the communities being studied represent age ranges, different socioeconomic levels? Merrimack has been exposed for over 20 plus years. Will there be similar comparisons? So I'm going to let Tara answer that, but I just want to do a yeah. check of where we're at. Um, I don't actually have a clock showing up on my screen right now. It's we're at 614. Okay. Great. Tara, right. take it away. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, when HSDR um, was starting out on this multi-site study plan, yeah, there was uh, an emphasis to try to have representation from communities across the country to exactly to do that, to try to represent different um types of communities since all communities are different and uh there are there i'm sorry are there is information on the seven study study sites that were selected on our website we can make that link available so you can go to the website and and check out the different studies um so each study site is being run a little bit differently in that all the data that's going to be collected from the study participants is um going to be the same. So that way we can compare across study groups and, and have a larger power of study. But there, the entities that are running the study sites have some um, ability to add on additional components they want to look at. And some of that um, is likely going to also impact you to know, like which people are included in that study in terms of how long they've been exposed for. Um, and we know it's hard. Again, as Gary mentioned, in 2014 was really the first time nationwide there started to be a look for these PFAS contaminants. But, you know, based on a site's history, we know the contamination likely started before 2014. It could be hard to nail down exactly when that contamination first entered um, the environment in a way that it could expose people. So those are all things that are being considered. and. I think you will ultimately find um, community members who've been exposed for a significantly long time. Uh, okay. Uh, Jonathan, is there a cutoff time that you want me to be aware of? Um, I think I just wanted to save about um, five minutes, five, seven minutes at the end to wrap things up. So we could probably do another two or three questions. Okay, we we do have a number of question, uh, additional questions, so they can be answered at a later time and posted, I guess. Um, comment from Representative Rosemary Rung: Any Merrimack residents on the call who want to follow up with a state representative, they are welcome to call her at her phone number. It's four two four six 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 four. Let's see. Comment, in order to build trust and engage with a community, you cannot anticipate that we are a mob. The barriers of not being able to ask our own questions is not a good dynamic. We can do better together. So just a comment about not uh, 
in the the format that we're using to this uh, this evening. Um, question: Why are studies not being done specifically in Merrimack? So is that a, all right, do you want to take that first? Because I think Katie and I can sort of address from state side if you want to address from ATSDR. Yeah, so um, I think I can try to address from the ATSDR side. So the study, the multi-site study process um, was a process by which ATSDR um, put out a call for like proposals for study sites from um, research entities. So that could be um, like a university or other similar type group who has the capacity to run a study and follow the study protocols and guidelines as they were written. Um, and then there was a process, it was like a competitive process where the those who applied were ranked by another um, group of folks, not the people at ATSDR who are the ones who are working with the study sites, but like a sort of an outside group. And ultimately, these eight sites were selected. So, you know, I think lots of communities around the country would really like a study. And it's always really challenging when we have limited resources and the ability to only study certain communities. So I know that can be really frustrating for communities. And what we hope though, is that some of the data we gather from these studies will still be applicable to your community. So, you know, and if we had lots more funding, potentially we could do lots more studies, but again, there's other limitations beyond just funding to make studies be able to launch successfully. So. That's sort of where we are. We're we're using the resources we were given, and we're trying to incorporate as much as we can to help answer community questions. And this is Gary. I just wanted to clarify. Sometimes the word study is used, and it, it can mean many different things. Yeah, but that's true. We are also looking at two health consultations, looking at the private water and the drinking water for public water within the Merrimack and surrounding communities. And those are pretty um, involved studies as well. But I know, I understand that the study is more looking at health outcome data. But prior to that, it's also, we need to look at, do the doses represent a health concern? So the starting point is typically the health consultations, which we're working on. Okay, I think that that actually helped to answer a number of comments that have been submitted. Uh, I'll end on this final one, and this is uh, for for Dr. Bush. Uh, will recommendations about integrating environmental health guidance into creating safe space for children be regulated? Is it, it is broadly optimistic to expect entities to do the right thing? So as part of the Choose Safe Places program, we'll be standing up sort of a multi-sector, multi-agency partnership where we hope to get feedback from local health officers, state regulators, and child care centers themselves to, to assess feasibility. As I said, we'll be putting together a strategic plan as we move into sort of year two and year three, and we may have you know a phased approach. Uh, but uh, luckily, we can learn from other states who have had this grant program in place for several years. And in many places, um, states are seeing the most success, again, with these sort of um, voluntary programs where, where folks can kind of opt in. And as I mentioned, I think that we already have great um, protocols and rules in place. We have quite a robust health officer checklist that's part of a, a site assessment. We also then have a, a state regulator that goes in and does a site assessment as part of the final licensing process. And in many cases, there are already stipulations to be evaluating air quality, water quality, and soil quality. So again, I think as we can raise awareness of those folks doing the, the investigations and make sure that they're using the, the best, most recent available data when evaluating a site and evaluating the site application, that we can actually leverage the existing rules and regulations and maybe just bring 
best practices and best data available to then guide the process. So um, again, what, as we move from year one to year two to year three, and then hopefully are successful in securing grant funding beyond that, you know, we'll move from, from developing a strategic plan to implementing it um, and really then evaluating it. And so, um, but we're optimistic that with a multi-sector partnership, we'll be able um, to kind of find those leverage points, I guess, within the system to, to have the greatest impact. Okay, with that, Jonathan, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, great, thank you, Jen. So that's gonna bring us to the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions or concerns or you know, you're about to go to bed tonight and something else pops in your brain, please feel free to email us. Um, reach out to us, here's our contact information, so you have our phone numbers as well as our email addresses. Um, if you're not sure who to send it to or who the right person is, Go ahead and send any one of us the question. We'll try to get it back to the right person and get your response to your question. Um, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time uh, for doing this this evening. I know 2020 has been kind of a bear with virtual meetings and everyone having Zoom or go to conferences everywhere. Um, I also want to go ahead and apologize for having the format where we were just having you submit comments. We were nervous about audio issues, so it in no way meant to be a slight against the community. We do not think of you as a mob. You're all great people. I miss having conversations with you all after meetings as well. But with that, um, here's our contact information. Again, reach out. Hopefully we can do this again um, with a better setup soon. And I just want everyone to have a good night and a safe holiday. Thank you.